So we have one more testimony. And um, it's funny, I was thinking about Stephanie. Stephanie is a mom that will be coming up here in just a moment. We've reached so far in this ministry over 2,000 families since we started. It's a lot of families. And most of the time, I don't get to meet, I would say, 15% of them. That might be embellishing. I don't even know if I get to meet that many. Never mind talk to them over the phone and, and have like a meaningful conversation that I retain. Um, my staff realize all the time that they have to remind me of people that they're working with. And I'm like, why don't you remember that? I just, I don't retain it. But Stephanie's story, I remembered. I got to speak to her when she was in that desperate reaching out position. And I remember getting off the phone going, I have no idea how we're going to help this situation. Like it was, it was a very, very challenging place. And now she just continues just to grow. And I'm honored to know her and she encourages my faith. And so if you could give a round of applause to Stephanie. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, so this is Stephanie, the one of whom he spoke, and I'm just gonna help uh, kind of facilitate some conversation here. Um, I'm betting that uh, I'm not gonna say a whole lot, um, but we would love to hear your story. Um, you can kind of maybe summarize things in terms of growing up and trauma and some of that background, and then um, we'll dig into it as we go. So, um, okay. So when I was 13 years old, my mother sent me to live with my uncle who was a predator and trafficked me for two years. I was then sent to a cult <laughs> who tried to re-virginate me through Christ. Um, after 30 years of going from trafficker to trafficker, I had my daughter. And when I had my daughter, I just knew that things were different. Not that she was my first child, she was my fifth child. Um, I had been able to provide my children to adoptive families who, who wanted to adopt children. So, um, but this left me still alone and searching. And when I had my daughter, I just knew that it was my time to, um, to reach out and to get some help. I tried several different times. I reached out to several different people. And through this, I went to churches, some just like Jesse was saying, to get some money. Some, um, in every church I went to, there was a little piece of Jesus that I got to take with me. Um, in 2017, I got on my hands and knees on the side of a road um, while my daughter was at my mother's house. She had been um, display, taken from me, removed from my custody. DCF placed her with my mom for a family foster. And so you get some of that trauma. Was there there's some drug history there? Oh, yes. Um, when my uncle initially trafficked me, he introduced me to heroin, and I was a heroin addict for 30 years. So in 2017, I got on my hands and knees and I asked God to either deliver me or bring me home to him. And 10 minutes later, I was in the back of a police car. I then um, was sentenced to drug court along with dependency court. So I would go see a drug court judge and a family court judge once every few weeks. Um, my drug court case manager just so happened to ask me, um, what happened? Why did we get here? How did we get here? And I told her, the first person that I told what my uncle had done to me. She said, you have been trafficked. And me thinking, you know, trafficking is a boy that gets shoved into a white van and disappears and is sent overseas. I didn't identify with that. I identified with the guilt and the shame that I had made these bad choices. I didn't, I couldn't differentiate that I had been coerced, abused, and beaten into the situations that I was in. You, you were being sold. Yes. 
and out of that, we're owning it as if you've been doing something wrong. Right. And it's just, yeah, just amazing to me to consider that how you were so badly abused and sold by a family member and then as an adult are holding onto this as if it's your fault. Right. Well, and then I wasn't just sold by the family member. I was in turn sold by everybody that I came in contact with year after year after year. So my identity, which was tied up in my body in a monetary way, so that's what I thought that I had to offer the world. And in that, you know, I, I didn't feel, I knew God like I was raised in the church. I had this foundation of Jesus and I knew that I could cry out to God. That was my safe place. But I did not feel the love of God. In, in the dependency and in the court, the lady was asking you about how you got to be there. Mm -hmm. And then from that, things began shifting a little bit. Um, was that here in Daytona or was that in? Um, that was in Jacksonville. Jacksonville. And I was still living with my trafficker at the time and my daughter. And um, I still just could not separate that I was good enough to be helped. So um, one day through the services that were provided, I just kept getting built up and built up and built up. I kept meeting people that were nice to me or spoke to me or in the grocery store gave me a hug or something nice because I didn't feel that way ever. Most of the time when I would go into stores or places, I was shunned, I was ostracized. When we see people on Ridgeway, we think that these girls are choosing this, but there is always somebody in a room in the background waiting to collect the money. And if she doesn't come, she's getting beaten if she doesn't provide it. Yeah, and you're beginning to figure out how to come out of that and then through the through the court system and more um, things shifted at some point you um, what's the what was the the shift from living with him to being able to move out well and then I was the only one I was still even though my body wasn't getting sold I was the only one working the only one paying for anything and I had worked a 16-hour shift and came home and he had left my daughter with a neighbor. And the neighbors had an autistic child who threw a wrench at my daughter's face. So I came home, he was nowhere to be seen, and my daughter's face looked like this. So I was able in that moment to provide her the protection that I was never provided. And I called my dad, who was still living at the time, and we moved to Mississippi, and that was the last time that I ever lived with a trafficker. So you finally got freedom from that. Yes. Dad still had problems, still wrestling with that. And in time, uh, at some point, you were able to move back to Florida. Was that with your mom or with him? No, that was in 2020, COVID came. That's right. And um, we were living with my dad, who was, um, has never been a responsible adult was never a responsible adult. And um, I got really scared that if something, I got COVID actually, and I got scared that if something happened to me, there was no one reliable for my daughter. My mother lives in Jacksonville, and I had a friend that lived in the Daytona area. I got what I thought was a job here and saved up money because I was getting unemployment at the time and moved to Daytona. Yeah, so you made your way here, yes. and, but the job didn't pan out, and all of a sudden, you guys are in trouble. Yep. And uh, what led you to making a phone call and getting connected with Salty? So I had most of the money I needed to rent a place, but as a convicted felon, there was no place to rent. So I went through Hope House, who helped me um, attain housing, which I paid for, but I still needed some help being employable or getting a job. So I was referred to Salty Family Services. Yeah. So to help be cut through that, again, partnership, so it's ministry partnership and connections, you're able to find some stability 
in providing for your daughter. And then um, at some point you called us and you got mit- matched up with a Brittany. I did. And then uh, Brittany was able to start meeting with you and then things began to continue to progress. And then it, 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 you were able to move from like uh, just part-time job to something more substantive and Salty uh, helped you get connected into um, a job using your history to help other people. So right. what was that first job? Well, it was at the Beacon Center Domestic Violence Shelter here in Volusia. It's actually Volusia County's only domestic violence shelter. I was looking for jobs and disqualified because of my um, background and I couldn't find anything. Brittany would call me because like the other lady that was up here, I canceled all the time, so the best way we could beat was on the phone because God was working in my heart. Um, I didn't need anything financially because I was getting unemployment, so it was like I didn't even know what I needed, but Brittany would call, and the one thing that she would say to me every time she called was, let us, let's pray. Let me just pray with you, and um, those prayers changed my life. Yeah, that's just every year when we do testimonies, the, the, the prayer, the financial is part of it, but then the prayer thing is just, so having somebody to meet with you and to give you that regular hope and a vision for, you were able to apply for a job that you were technically disqualified for because of your history, right. but then because of our connections, they, they gave you a shot. They gave me a shot and they kept me there against DCF regulation because they didn't want to lose me as an employee. So they, were, they valued your place, um, overlooked the history, you were able to work for them. And then eventually, um, you I maybe stayed with them a year or two, and then eventually had an opening for another job. And that was in a, took you to Jacksonville, is that right? It did. Well, first, it was here. The program was here in mm-hmm. Volusia County. It closed quickly. It was called the Open Doors Program that helped children from the ages 10 to 24 who had been trafficked. Yeah, so you're working in that. And yes. um, so now, I mean, coming just coming out of that situation is miraculous enough. But then through the connections and relationships, through your healing, then you're able to move into a place where you're actually helping other people, you right. know? And so to be able to help a client saying, look, I've been there, I've seen this, I've done this. Right. Just amazing that you've been able to do that. Yes. And so that, that kind of brings us up to um, maybe even where we were at just in the last year or two recently. Right. Um, but let me just kind of put a pin on there from there. At this point, you're, you're doing well. I mean, it, it, you were able to keep a job, even buy a house. Buy a house, yes. And, you know, I remember you saying a year or so ago, talking about your daughter, you know, first of all, that she would be in foster care today if it weren't for Salty. Correct. Um, and then, and just, just the little things of hearing things like two years in a row, she was at the same school for the first time in her life. And for the first time, having enough school supplies, yeah. those little things just add up and build, and it's such a, a an, an amazing thing. Um, and so, from that point on, it's okay. Success, we're smooth sailing. Life is good, no problem. Right. We think right? that we prayed. God will supply the desires of your heart. My desires were supplied. I thought awesome. that I was in the right place. Yes. I really felt that God was using. This past, I was able to take so many different trainings, educate myself. I went through different um, peer support programming classes. Like I was really felt like I was around my people. Was, and somewhere in there, you were able to get your record erased, expunged. expunged. Yes. So through some court proceedings and you were able to get that erased? Yes. That's like. I mean, and it's not, well, that's not a small thing. It, it wasn't a arrest. It was 30 years of arrest. A, a lot. Yeah, it was and 17 pages. 17 pages of an arrest record that got expunged. Yes. Miraculous. I mean, just Miraculous, amazing. Yeah. But <laughs> there's a problem. Yeah. So you're working, you're serving in the best possible way. Your, your record is a, a forgotten. Yes, I'm excelling at work. Best employee, always there, dedicated. But what but happened? I was called into the office in February of this year and told that DCF didn't recognize my expungement and I was had to be I was fired as of March fifteenth. That's yeah, just six six months ago. Yeah. And so from this amazing, just wonderful success story to 
all of that brought back and dropped in your lap and said, oh yeah, you're, you're, you're not qualified. You, that history sit, you know, sits with you and everybody else is forgetting it, but we're not gonna forget it. We're gonna hold it against you and then take the thing that you worked so hard to get is, is been taken from you. And it brings the guilt and the shame that yes. Jesus has already taken away back. Yes. So, so, so you lost the job in, you said February, March, March? March 15th was my last March 15. Um, so you lost your job and it's really easy to fall back into old ways and old patterns and old thoughts. It's easy right. to fall back into that, but, but you didn't. What I learned from Salty is that, and for everybody that's here, um, religious organizations, Christian organizations are detrimental to survivors of long-term trauma because being able to trust Jeff, Brittany, you being able to speak here, being given a forum to just like rebuild my life. And I didn't get a car from here. I got a phone call that changed my entire life. So it's not all monetary. And, um, but it allowed me to be able to trust other faith-based organizations. And I had support for the first time, real support, Christian support. And I knew from Brittany that I could pray and prayer change things. So I prayed. You prayed. Um, since then, you got a job in a different field, right? Well, I, when I bought my house, I was able to rejoin my childhood church in Mandarin um, and joined a Sunday school group. One of my Sunday school friends, really my whole Sunday school class is over 60 and they were ready to fight the governor. They were mad. <laughs> but um, one of my Sunday school friends had a friend who had suffered a, a real bad family tragedy and needed some care for her 90-year-old mother. So now I'm in... Um, school to get my degree in political science. Hold on a second, hold yeah. on a second. Because it, it's a big deal. Um, so you got a job, and it was a yes. job that paid well, and so More you're, than I was making at the other place. So yeah, you're making more money, so yeah. now at this point, okay, fine. You got treated the way you did, you got fired, uh, let it go, forgive and forget. You were making a good a job, so now you can just live your life. But you, you're not gonna just let it go, no. why? No because the laws have to change. Policy has to change in order for things to really change. Like we can, and, and really and truly the only cure we carry with us every day is Jesus Christ. And in order for us to reach people, there have to be barriers, have to be broken. It's not fair that I can't even work at a hotel on Ridgeway right now. It's not fair. It's not fair because I was designated a, I'm a verified survivor of human trafficking in the state of Florida, but DCF will not let me work to help other children that are being trafficked. And who's better qualified to do it but you? But it's so, so I'm mad and you're mad yeah. Yeah. and it's this political season, let's complain about it and right. we can complain about politicians and we can complain about the government and I'm happy to help you, but... That's not exactly what you're doing. You're, no. you're identifying there's a big problem. Right. But you've also said somebody's got to fix it. Right. And I, and I believe that people like me, if we rise up and educate ourselves, that we can place ourselves in positions, in systems to affect actual change. So you, yes, so we believe in that. But the, you haven't heard the punchline yet. Here's the punchline. You are in school. Yeah. And your, your degree you're looking for is? In political science. Why? So that I could lobby for the laws to be changed for survivors like me. How about that? Yeah. Mm. <clears throat> to me, it's just, it's unbelievable, you know, because it's easy to fall back into brokenness and shame and guilt. Right. It's easy to fall back. Uh, it's tougher to survive. And then just as a survivor, you deserve, you know, a, a, a life that, that you work for, but, but that's not enough for you. And I love the fact that you're like, no, you're not going to get away with it. 
I'm going to do whatever it takes to go fix this problem so that other people don't have to live like I did. And to me, that's just amazing. Right. And that's because of what was done to you again, in this case, by the government in March, you're going to use that to really make the world a better place. Thank you. Yeah, there you go. Thanks. Okay. 